there's three parts to Torah. One is the person, one is the Torah itself, which is the body of knowledge, okay, whatever this is. One is the giver of the Torah, God, and the other one is the recipient of Torah, namely Klai Yisro. Okay, I'm just going to take a very simple model like that. <coughs> when you think of Torah, most people focus on the per object, uh, perception of Torah as an object in its own right. It's like, it seems that Torah can be defined independently. Here is Torah. The fact is, is that Torah actually is impossible to define without the giver and the receiver. Torah is, the, the Torah is a dynamic entity that is affected by how you understand the giver, i.e. God, and also how you understand the receiver. Now, most people will extend Torah to understanding God. And they'll sit there and say that the purpose of Torah connects you to God, and you know, and the idea that, that the Torah and God are one and so forth, and there's an idea of the spirituality of it and the connection. What most people don't do is understand that the recipient of Torah is part of that dynamic. Torah was not given to blank pages. What I mean by that is this. Most people perceive that to understand Torah, you basically come as blank as possible. Torah is supposed to fill you up. You're supposed to be like a totally open uh, pit just to take in Torah. That you yourself aren't a factor in that in that rece re reception. The fact is, is that works in fundamentalist Christianity. Okay, fundamentalist Christianity basically says you have to be you have to be non-existent. You have to just take in whatever the Bible says. You know, you know, just take it on face value. Um, in terms of that, for example, like for example, if you push fundamentalist Christians, I have a, a close friend of mine, um, Rabbi Rabbi Mike Skoback, who's one of the most strongest anti-missionaries, greatest anti-missionaries in, in the world. I mean, you know, most successful and so forth. And he will tell you that when he argues with fundamentalists, a lot of the time they won't say, "I will go home and think about it." They'll say, "I'll go home and pray about it." Okay, because thinking brings you into the equation. They want to go home and pray about it. The point is, is that a lot of ways in terms of fundamentalists is like I don't want to be there. The reality of Torah is if you don't know how to ask the correct question you'll miss the boat. You won't understand it. So Torah demands of you to be there. You are not supposed to be a blank page when you come to Torah. You'll miss the lesson. We actually learned this from the story of the Akeda. Okay? Everyone points to Avram before the Akeda, right? That Avram Avinu basically was told by God, go kill your son, and Avram didn't ask any questions. Mm. Fine. Understandable. The truth of the matter is, is, is that, first of all, there's a challenge in the sense that right before the Akeda story, the big story is Stom. And in Stom, Avram is asking the question. He's basically saying, Ashofa Kolar Asayas and Mishpat, I don't get it, God. This doesn't sound just to me. Now, he's taking his own, now this is what Warren Lichtenstein says, and he's taking his own rational ethic of justice and saying to God, hey, I don't get it. You're supposed to be just, and I don't see the justice here. And he's basically saying, I have to understand justice, so you have to explain it to me. And God is wonderful basically by telling Abraham that he's going to, he's going to, um, Wait, that storm is actually telling Avram, he actually said it. I can't do this without running it by Avram. Because Avram, and, and Avram Lutensin says this shows you that natural morality, the natural morality of, of Avram Avinu, a sense of justice, is a figure. And Avram, in, in understanding, doesn't just say, listen, God, you're saying let's wipe out storm. You, you obviously know justice. I'm keeping quiet. He says, listen, I didn't understand it. I have to understand it. Okay, so the point is, his own natural morality opens up the question. The next thing, though, is by Akeda, he doesn't do that. That's a whole question in itself. But after the Akeda, one of the first things he does, the first thing the Medjur says he does, 
is right after the whole end of the event. What's the first thing he does? He turns to the guy and says, I didn't get it. You said, go kill a Yitzchak, and then you say, from Yitzchak, I'll have my Yikrela uh, Chazara. I'll have my progeny. So I don't understand it. If I'm going to kill Yitzchak, how can my, ki- how can my progeny come from Yitzchak? And the answer the Major says, the Kodesh Baruch says, I never said to you that you should, that you should kill him. I said to you, Haleo Sham Ola. Place him on the Mizbech as an Ola. I just told you to place him on the Mizbech. I never said for you to actually go through the Korban. Now, the truth of the matter is, if Ram took to you to say Haleo Sham Ola, usually means a Korban. But the fact is, I forget who says it, I think the base lady says, this is the introduction to halachic reasoning. What a Kodesh Baruch Hu is basically saying to a Ram is when I say something, you better put it through the ringer of your mind. Because if you don't put it through the ringer of your mind with your questioning, you're not going to get the right answer. So the base of Levi basically says, this is the this is the opening to halachic reasoning. And the fact is, is the whole study of Torah from Alpeh is basically God says something, we don't take it at face value. We try, and we, in, in terms of trying to understand it, it's not just being Madaic and Apostolic. We have to ask questions. And some of those questions we free from stone come from our ethical perception. About how everything's a chog. Even a chog, we have to understand. Basically, in the end, it might come down and say, listen, I don't quite understand it, but it seems clearly that this is what God wants. But, right? So I can't sit there and say, I, like the Aguna, the Gemara, the Gemara says, there's so many times you hear Poskim. In a certain situation, I know this, so that people answer, you know, like all the shallows and shuvas farm are basically people trying to find a heter, and they're not just trying to find a heter by playing games, they're trying to say, listen, I'm trying to find what the real Torah is really saying, and they come up to an idea, like if you really read a, a, a like a real great post, like, you, like for me, I, you read the Igris Moshe, and you have a halacha that seems to be problematic, especially in a certain ethical situation or whatever. And then he goes back, learns the Gemaras, and then he does something and he comes out that it's very clear that your original understanding was wrong. And his Chiddush, his final psak, is really what was right. And at the end you're walking around and saying, this is exactly what the Gemara is saying. This is exactly what the Halacha is. And the fact is, is that because of your questioning, because of your ethical dilemmas, you basically say, now I really understand what God wants. Now, does it happen that sometimes you have to walk away and say, it seems that I don't understand what God wants, and this is the halacha? But a lot of times the post can say, lo I haven't been able to, to work it out. But you take situations, a lot of halachic situations, they don't, the, the post scheme, and to me this is, one, this is a different concept where I see the difference in terms of, of, of the conservative movement and how they deal with certain halachic issues because they try to still apply halacha in their conclusions, but you see real post scheme. But basically you walk away saying, that really is the pshat. They're motivated by, by their questioning to sit there and say, I have to try and understand it, and then they walk away saying, this is what it really makes sense. This is what really makes sense. And you walk away saying, gee, that, that, that really so- seems to make sense. And you say, that's really what a Kodesh Baruch Hu wanted. But the only way they got there is because they knew how to ask the question. And they weren't afraid of their selves. That, by the way, was a byline where Nish were flung from Torah to self. The fact of the matter is they weren't afraid of who they were. Because they understand that what they were were people who basically were thinking and were being asked questions, and, not, and the questions were, were motivated for further understanding. What exactly is going on? And the fact is, is that that's really what it's about. So the fact is, is that in terms of analyzing Torah, in many ways, you've got to bring your game. You've got to bring yourself to the table. Now, the truth is, is that going to create a certain amount of issues and controversy? Is it going to create a certain amount of debate? Well, we have different ways. They say, Shivim Param Torah. We have a lot of different ways of how we apply God's Torah to us as individuals. But you've got to bring yourself to the table. You've got to bring your mind to the table. You have to know how to ask the questions. Now, in the end, you have to sit there and say, listen, the only way I can understand this Gemara is the way that uh, is problematic. And, and that's it. I've had many situations, like for example, as, as, as a person is asked Shiloh's, 
Um, and um, I'll present the different viewpoints and so forth and so forth. And I know there's another position there that's more more lenient and, and so forth. And a person will ask me to Shiloh. I say, listen, I I don't see like it's not just a matter of taking your lenient position. You have to believe that's the right shot. You have to really believe it's the right understanding of the Gemara, the right understanding of the halacha. There's situations where I know other people are more makel, but I don't read the Gemara that way. I can't. There's, it, to me. A, new, or a more stringent position may make sense. So if a person comes up to me and asks me a shayla, there are times I'll sit there and say, you don't ask me. If a person is a Talmud of mine and so forth and so forth, then I, they're asking me because they want to follow me. If a person comes up to me and says, don't ask me. So other people can ask. Because I don't want to impose my understanding upon them. Because I know there's other people who have more lenient understandings. But at the same point in time, I have to be honest to myself and my understanding of the Gemara's. Right? And the fact is, is that sometimes I'll sit there, I know the situations where people come up to me and say, but you hold to this other rabbi who's more makel and that you, you think highly of him. Why, why don't you do like him? I said, because that's his psak, I have a different psak. But the fact is, is that Elu Ve'elu, that's what Elu Ve'elu is about. Because you have to meet your own standards of what you think is right in your mind. But you've got to bring yourself to the table. And one of those ways of bringing yourself to the table is ethical issues. We all have our own ethical perceptions. We have our own understanding of things, certain ethics. And that's what. And, and the fact is, the world does those ethical analysis. The world, the world has ethical perceptions. Would you and, say that yeah. this ethical perception that the world has has been guided through, like, religion? Like it, it's it's a lot of the ethical perceptions that exist in Western society now originally came from Judaism. I remember I remember like for example, this was a shir I gave many years ago. Okay, freedom of religion. How many people think freedom of religion is a, is is a is a worthwhile value? Freedom of religion. Right. Freedom yeah. to be religious. I guess. Or for no in in North, North America, when America talks about freedom of religion, we apply freedom of religion. Very right very important, right? We live in America but under freedom of religion. Does Judaism believe in freedom of religion? No. Yeah, so, they yes. Wait, what exactly sort of is the freedom of religion is that you can practice your own religion. But yes. Judaism believes in... Yes. In, it's not um, a non yeah, No, I don't think Judaism believes in freedom of religion. Okay. So, we so let me... Let me well, that, that's a big problem. There was a case that happened... <laughs> there was a case that happened in Baltimore. There, were, there was a case that... I think it was Baltimore or it might have been Florida. A case like this where there were idolaters, pagans, who wanted to do animal sacrifices. Okay? What was it? There were pagans in... in, in what in, time in period is this? Last 10 years. Really? Yeah, this was in America. This was an American case. 10, 15 years, okay? There were pagans who wanted to do animal sacrifices. Okay? And um, what happened was is that is that it was in violation of certain animal cruelty laws in the states. So therefore, people said, um, you can't do it. So they argued, they went to court, they argued freedom of religion, we should be allowed to sacrifice animals and override your animal cruelty laws. Hmm. Got it? Okay. Numerous from organizations, I believe the OU, Aguda, public policy, major from organizations, all came down on the side of the idolaters. <coughs> so you had from organizations fighting for the right of idolaters really? to bring... Why? Why? Because what happened? Because of cash rates. Because a lot of people are against Exactly. Because uh, if you sit there and say that, that if they would have lost that case, it would have it would have it would set a precedent that we don't have an argument of freedom of religion in Kashrus and Shrita. We don't have an argument of freedom of religion in terms of Milo. But it's for eating as yeah. opposed to yes. sacrifice. What it's freedom of religion. So if you come to that, it's, it's, we, we say we, we they, the people are saying it's cruel to animals right. to to kill this way. Shrita is no longer the the most humane way to kill an animal. The right. way they kill animals now is much more humane. On the surface, from from scientific yeah. uh, scientific arguments, I thought right? It scientifically, is more humane. No, well, not anymore. Yeah, yeah, I guess now, yeah. now they used right. to do it in a that's way. Right. Like like a and, and by the way, the Ramban says, for yeah. example, in terms of the Ramban says in terms of uh, um, 
in terms of Sar Bali Chaim. He makes some statements, but he says, if you're really, really concerned about the animal, you wouldn't be eating them. <laughs> you know, okay, so the, the, you know, so the point is, is that, yeah. you know, it's like, it's the most humane way of killing you. I mean, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and so forth. Okay, the truth is, is humanity, but the fact is, is that we are, we are sensitive to the animals, but there's, you know, certain, you know, issue in terms of our sensitivity. So, you know, I, you know, th this is, you know, you know, um, I mean, you, you want to, I'm not trying to totally negate sensitivity to the animals. We have to recognize that, that, um, you know, um, you still are not totally uh, um, Judaism stand on on uh, on, uh, on animal cruelty is is not as uh, as uh, it's not as liberal as you might think. Um, the fact is, though, is that um, you know we're not big fans of hunting. I think that that's a little bit problematic. But the fact is, is that that's that's sort of what you're you're dealing with. So the point is, is is in terms of of um, um, the world you had is is in terms of protecting freedom of religion under the American Constitution, which is for our benefit. We got in there, and they, and they basically supported idolaters, pagans, bringing animal sacrifice. Okay, because it was necessary in order to protect freedom of religion for Jews. Great. So when I ask that question, okay, what do you think according to Torah? Does Torah have a, 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 allow freedom of religion? If you had a Torah society, would you sit there and say, freedom of religion, let's, uh, the pagans should be allowed to bring sacrifices? No. It would seem like the... the it would seem not. not well, I right? think in Eretz Yisrael, no, but everywhere else, yes, because our, our battle is, like, we've, all, we've always been in our little area. Okay, so now you're getting to the issue of Eretz Yisrael, whatever it is. The fact is, is there is an issue of how far you have to go to prevent idolatry, but the truth of the matter is, it seems to be, if you look at, uh, at the Chumash on the surface, we're not very tolerant of idolatrous practices. No. Now, the point is, is how do you take that intolerance to, 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 and how do you apply it to freedom of religion? Now, the, all, what I'm really raising is a value dilemma. Why do you guys feel positive about freedom of religion? Because the fact is, you're saying, that's what a person thinks, and that's the same. So, who am I to impose my values upon them? So many freedoms of everything else. Right. Because we feel this world. Of, well, I know for me specifically, the way I look at it is, right now we are in Gullis. we are in exile. We're just trying to exist. And again, going on that whole idea, whatever helps us exist. But what, 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 what you're what you're doing is giving a practical reason. In other words, we have to. We want these rules, even if we don't believe in them, because they're for our benefit, but not because we believe in the values of those rules. Right. But the point is, I'm asking, do you want to live with that? I'll tell you, I'll tell you the problem with that. Um, many, many years ago, the, Nazi, the American Nazi Party wanted to have a march through Skokie. Yeah. Okay? Okay, have you guys ever heard of this or whatever? Yeah, okay. Skokie. Okay, Skokie is a suburb, uh, is a suburb of Chicago that, that was heavily Jewish. The Nazi party wanted to have a march, a peaceful march through Skokie. Okay? They wanted to get a permit for that and so forth and so forth. No violence, just marching through for whatever reason and so forth. And their argument was freedom is freedom of, 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 of expression, freedom of, of what do you call it, of, of, of speech, of, of, of um, assembly, and so forth and so forth. We're meeting all the rules to do that. But obviously, it was through Skokie because it was a Jewish suburb, and it was, it was obviously directed against the Jews. The argument that, now, what happened was I saw a press conference. He had an ACLU lawyer. With the head of the American Nazi Party, and the ACLU lawyer was arguing for all the freedoms and the freedom of, and we have to protect freedom and so forth and so forth. And obviously, the ACLU lawyer doesn't like the Nazis, but the classic line, "I'm in favor of freedom of speech, even though the guy's going to say something I abhor, but freedom of speech is more important," and so forth and so forth. And I think the ACLU lawyer was actually Jewish. Yeah. Okay. Kind of like what happened with Ezra Levant recently against the Muslims. They had to argue for freedom of speech right. in order to, to, to so talk against right. Uh, right. Islamic extremists. Right. And, uh, it, it, but in this situation, so here was the interesting yeah. situation. A, a reporter asked the Nazi, okay, he said, 
here you are arguing for freedom of speech that you should that you should walk down you should you should you should go in, in, in Skokie under freedom of speech but you don't believe in freedom of speech how can you take this argument of freedom of speech and and, and, and use it to defend it when you don't even believe in it so the Nazi said basically if you guys are stupid enough to have a value like freedom of speech which is totally stupid of value why shouldn't I take advantage of your stupidity and apply freedom of speech? So that always, and, and, and look at this, and that always hit me when people start giving arguments for freedom of religion on a practical basis. Are you basically saying that, listen, I don't believe in this value, but if you're going to give me that value, I'm going to take it because it's my best interest, but I don't believe in it? Is that what we're doing? Well, that puts us in the same category with that Nazi. So the truth is, is, is that I don't think it's so simple to argue simply that, 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 that Torah doesn't believe in freedom of religion. There's a big difference between the way we walked into, into, into Eretz Canaan, when Yeshua walked into Eretz Canaan, and dealing with, 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 with the world today. And what's that big difference? Power. It's, no, it's not just power. It's Yudhiya Hashem. Right. It's the same argument that Chazanish uses for why there's no knowing knowledge of God. The same argument that, that the Chazanish uses why there's no real Apikursim today. The same argument we use for saying that people are Tinik Shanishpas and so forth and so forth. The fact of the matter is, is when Yeshua walked into, you know, entered Canaan, okay, he went to Yericho. The, 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 the witnesses that went to Yericho, you know, they, they, were, they were taken over, they, they were watched over by Rachav. Rachav basically says, we know who you are. What do you think? We don't know what happened in the desert for the last 40 years. We don't know what happened 40 years ago to Egypt. He says, listen, I got the message. You guys are God, a God's nation. And listen, I'm, I'm helping you guys out here. But when you come and take over Yericho, remember me and make sure that uh, I'm not uh, with the other guys. Because I got the message. What does that tell you? Yericho basically willing to fight against a nation that 40 years previously basically exited Egypt in a tremendous destruction of the, big, of the most powerful nation in the world, lived for 40 years in the desert, totally miraculously, with the Anan they had covered, so, totally, totally covering them, a well walking behind them, money coming down from heaven, right? Wiping out other nations without, without any issues. If you read the miracles that were happening, you look at them saying, what kind of idiot would want to fight God? And then you look at it and say, Yericho basically got the message and say, no, no, we still want to, we still don't want to follow this. Because they were given a message. Yoshua said, listen, here are the three, here are the three things that are going to happen. You can leave, just pack it for Mary Sisrael, and we won't come after you. You can stay and follow Shem Mitzvah B'nai Noach. Or you can fight and we're going to wipe you off. Right? So these guys decide they're going to fight. What are, they, what, 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 what are you, idiots? Are you crazy? I mean, like, what do you think is going to happen to you? So you see from Rachav, they knew what was going on. There was no doubt that God was with the Jews. That leads into a whole question of why these people, you know, basically said, we're going to fight. That leads to a whole question of understanding Yitzhakar and, and why they would do that and stuff right. like that. But the fact is, 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 that, is that that's a different situation than today when you don't have obvious arguments. And that really is the opening of understanding freedom of religion from a Jewish perspective. That's really a matter of understanding I don't know. And therefore it creates a very different perspective. Now, the Jewish understanding of freedom of religion from I don't know is very different than the, than the secular understanding of freedom of religion. But the point is, is that this, this is the struggle we face. And these are the struggles in our world today. And the fact is, is that it comes about through basically taking those questions and understanding that those questions open up vistas of Torah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it's like um, for every question you don't ask, it's like thousands and thousands of ideas in Torah are lost. You know, the fact is, is that we're still uncovering ideas in Torah. And a lot of a lot of the, the ideas that existed, they already existed. We found that we now have new concepts, which now open up new understandings of Torah. But we're supposed to bring ourselves, our questions, to understanding them, understanding Torah. 
and 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 that's really what 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 what, what happens. The first thing you have to do is you have to bring yourself. You got to bring your mind. Okay, and you got to understand. And then you start looking at details. Yeah. The question like uh, that you just brought up, or the statement you just brought up, the question because you said that we're bringing up new ideas in Torah. When you when your wife made a comment in her class, and then the rabbi told her you don't talk about that, and you pulled out the wrong button. Yeah. That concept, it, there are the questions. Questions. There, there are no ideas. The ideas are there. We're, always, just not, we're just not aware of that. The truth is, those questions have existed. The point is, that we have new questions. What are the new? Like what is? We new? have new questions because of the change in the world. Freedom of religion is a very new concept. The point is you can pull out ideas from Torah, but the point is is that we, identity, autonomy, individual rights, the fact that we, we, we that, that the you know there's certain statements that are made in in, in, in American Constitution, the inalienable rights of 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 of, uh, of, uh, of people. Why are they inalienable? Who says that you have a right? No. Who says you have a right to 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 peace or you know to uh, uh, to you know, or or the American the American Bill of Rights, we believe that you know a person has a basic right to uh, to you know to right to bear arms. Right, right. Yeah. As as long as you were white, according to the according to the the, uh, the original uh, original sure. original understanding of it. But that was that was that's one of the reasons, for example, that a lot of people talk that the the American Revolution didn't really end until the Civil War because of that conflict. Because you then you say all human beings are you know, have these rights, and then you sit there and say, but not blacks. No, but still, right. so, until the civil rights era, it's still still, it's still continued on. And then you look back on the world, and you talk about rights. I mean, yeah, they, yeah, like just uh, just recently. Right, but you you look back, like for example, you, you read some things about the Civil War, and it's absolutely mind-boggling how many people believe. I mean. One of the big things in the Civil War was that the Southern Baptists in the, in the South believed that it was God's um, right will, right? right. And, 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 and there was there, there I, I saw this in terms of American debates. There were people who were arguing that which God distinguished and made different. Who are you making the same? And there was obviously blacks and whites are different. That's the way God made them. Whites are better than blacks. And now you're trying to make them equal. That was a, that was a religious argument before the Civil War, and that and by the way, I remember when the same-sex marriage debate came up, and people talked about religious rights. I remember one. Um, I found out that she was she she was uh, um, um, a lesbian, but, but I remember I was watching on CNN, and she basically said, "What? Because but there were religious arguments back before the Civil War that said." Whites were better than blacks. We're going to let religious art. We, we we basically destroyed those religious arguments that whites are better than blacks. So now we're 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 going to apply religious arguments uh, against homosexuality. The fact of the matter is, is that there are a lot of tensions there. And where do you get these ideas? And how do you understand it? But I mean, I, I'm not. I'm just saying that these are questions. But the fact is, is to most people, these are questions that you have to deal with because. You know, you're practical, apologetics, and so forth and so forth. Right. To me, these are essential Torah questions. This is what makes the Torah really thing. When I say new ideas, I'm not saying totally new ideas. What I'm saying is, is the number of Torah is like, you know, is that the Hagdil Torah Ladira. The Torah grows and becomes more, more, um, um, more, mag more magnificent. The truth of the matter is, from a Chadish Dabra Kol Dor. Whole, whole yom, you know, the, the ideas, new ideas in Torah come about. And, and you know, Ramosha Feinstein was attacked with for some of his chidushim. He's saying, what, there's a kates to Torah? Tell me you don't have chidushim? The truth of the matter is, is that we have chidushim, and, and especially given some of these questions which didn't come up before because the world didn't have to deal with them before. You know? And, and that's really what comes about. And the truth is, is once you understand this, this, broader perspective of Torah implies even halachic reasoning. The truth of the matter is, halacha is not just looking up in the Shulchan Aruch and here's halacha. Halacha becomes understanding the concepts behind it. Okay? And then some people are more some people are more makel, but the point is you understand that you're trying to find the Ratz and Hashem. Okay? And the Ratz and Hashem demands it from you. You have to be the one who discovers the Ratz and Hashem for you. Okay, in a certain way, it means that really, ideally, ideally 
everyone should be a posik for themselves, so everyone should know enough Torah to be a posik for themselves. Right? But the fact is, is you have to know that's, that's a tremendous undertaking. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of knowledge. But the point is, is that you have to, you have to come up with new ideas. And, 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 and when you're working on that level, you're working with concepts and ideas, and the world becomes a different world because you're constantly seeing things anew. So that's, anyways, that's, that's what, uh, okay, I, I, I'm going to try and um, find something. What? No, sorry, sorry, turn off. No, no, it's, all, it's okay. I'm going to try and figure out where I want to start with. Um, like I said, maybe we'll start with some ethical issue, uh, ethical halachas, okay? Um, I'll try and find something to start with. Maybe we'll start with some more broader perspectives. Um, Shulis is coming. It might be something in terms of understanding Kabbalah to Torah in terms of its broader perspectives. There's a, few, there's a few concepts which I want to share with you guys and then it will open up new, new vistas. Um, and then we'll try and deal with um, certain halachic ideas. But if, um, you know, anyways, we can, we, can, we can go from there.